I think the early Christians loved to tell these two stories that we find in today's scripture. They were charming stories, actually, and one of the reasons that I think early Christians enjoyed them is because they clearly set Jesus apart from the Pharisees, from the religious leadership of the day. When the Jews were captured by the Babylonians and, and the leadership dragged off to captivity in Babylon where they were held as prisoners for 70 years. The first thing they attempted to do was protect themselves from the Babylonian influence. They wanted to maintain a sense of being the children of Israel, the people called by God to a unique mission in a strange land. That's not an unusual effort, but it was for them very difficult to maintain a sense of being faithful Jewish people in a strange place, surrounded by people who followed a different religion, pretty much what we would call Zoroastrianism today. And so there they were, in this strange place. Well, how did they manage that? Well, they managed that in part by forming a special group of lay people. They called them Pharisees. And their job was to help the children of Israel maintain their faith with as much purity as possible in a strange land. That's where the Pharisees got their start. They were rescuers. They were protectors. They were educators. They were people who helped a captive people continue their identity, their former identity. And they were successful. But then they all came home the captives and the Pharisees together, they all came home and started in again. But now they were in their own land, surrounded by themselves. They were no longer captives. They were no longer on threat from the neighbors. They could live the way they wished. And the Pharisees took up right where they left off, as if they were still in Babylon. And they named themselves protectors of their faith. And they snooped around on anybody who did practice any evidence of religion that was even in the slightest way different. So they, they grabbed onto Jesus right away. They saw he was a threat to them. I don't know whether they put people, as the Gestapo did many years later, within Jesus' movement, but they certainly had plenty of Pharisees outside of his movement watching everything he did listening to every word he spoke and criticizing him constantly. If they were keeping a record, they were keeping some kind of legal record of all of the things that Jesus did that were wrong. And on this day, it was no exception. There they were, as Jesus and his disciples made their way on the Sabbath through a grain field, a field of wheat. And it was lunchtime. They were hungry. So the disciples kind of 
clipped off the heads of grain from a few branches on the edge of the field. And because the grain comes all encap encapsulized within a certain shards, they strip those off too. And then they ate them. Well, <laughs> right away, the Pharisees pounced. They pounced on Jesus as the head of the group and held him responsible for the terrible violation of the Sabbath that had just taken place. They broke the rules. Shortly after that, Jesus and his disciples entered a synagogue. Now we don't know if the man with the withered hand was a plant or whether he just happened to be there that day. But Jesus spotted him immediately. Right away, he saw that man suffering with a hand that wasn't working properly for him, with muscles that were uh, broken or inhibited or twisted or something, with sinews and tendons and all the rest that goes into making a hand operate properly. That hand didn't work. Jesus saw the suffering and immediately addressed it. It's the only time in all of the Gospels that there's a record of Jesus healing someone without first asking him. He didn't ask. He just did it. And the Pharisees wrote it down. You healed on the Sabbath? That's against the rules. And Jesus' response was always the same. He put people first. He asked them, in your judgment, was the Sabbath made for humans? Or were humans made for the Sabbath? I bet they hated that question. I bet you they went out of that synagogue mumbling and murmuring to themselves about why is he so smart? Why does he always ask those tough questions? The Mishnah, the Jewish writings, came into existence sometime after this and listed 39 categories of work forbidden on the Sabbath. But just listen to this list. Carrying. Burning. Extinguishing. Finishing. Writing. Erasing. Cooking. Washing, sewing, tearing, knitting, knotting, having trouble reading my writing here, shaping, painting, planting, Harvesting, threshing, winnowing. That's what the disciples were doing when they stripped the bark off the grain. Winnowing, I guess. Warping, weaving. Unraveling, building, demolishing. Shearing, slaughtering, skinning, tanning, smoothing, marking. <laughs> you get the idea. Every little thing 
It was against the Sabbath laws to walk more than a certain distance on the Sabbath. And so what the, what the Jewish people learned to do was on the day before, on Friday, they'd prepare a, a sack lunch, so to speak, and they'd put it at the end of that uh, span of, of distance that you could walk. And on the Sabbath, they'd walk to where they'd put their sack lunch, sit down, eat it, and it was like a new day. Then they could do the next one. And if they were smart on Friday, they packed more than one sack lunch. So they could stop and eat, stop and eat, stop and eat, and walk a pretty good distance from one village to another, perhaps. And that was okay. Kind of silly at the time. But those were the Pharisees, and those were the rules that they made up to make sure that the Jews in Babylon stayed faithful to their religion. The trouble was they tried to put Babylon over on top of Israel. And it, according to Jesus, at least, it didn't fit very well. So he and the Pharisees had one dispute after another. And they socked up a whole range of violations by Jesus, which could be used in court against him. And they were. And of course, he was punished and he died. But it wasn't just Mark who gives us a record here. Matthew also has words, and Luke also has words, and describes this incident, and talks about the silliness of so many of these rules that have nothing to do with, with one's spiritual welfare. Well, Jesus talked to these Pharisees, uh, apparently, in, in Mark's telling, and they would not be moved away from the hard line that they took on the Sabbath. So Jesus, uh, Mark writes about Jesus, he was grieved at their hardness of heart. That's the biggest problem, their hardness of heart. Now these people were not soft-hearted, they were hard-hearted. They drew a line. They drew a line in their mental sand and they would not move beyond that line. Hardness of heart. In one of the churches I served at one time a father and his teenage daughter had a fight of some sort, and they stopped talking to each other. They pledged never to speak to each other again. They hardened their hearts, and it was tragic, and it was foolish. It took a long time before we were able to put some sort of a a wedge in there and get them talking again. They had to soften their hard hearts. Matthew writes about it this way. You have been given a teachable heart to perceive the deeper meaning of my teaching, says Jesus. But to those who don't have a listening heart, my words are mere stories. Even though they have eyes, they are blind to the true meaning of what I say. Even though they listen, they won't receive full revelation. And Luke wrote, the eyes of your spirit allow light to enter into your being, 
When your heart is open, light floods in. When your heart is closed, the light cannot penetrate and darkness takes its place. The great sadness about the Pharisees is that they suffered from hardness of heart. They stopped listening, they stopped seeing, they stopped knowing, they stopped being enlightened, they kept the light out and fumbled along in their spiritual darkness. Hardness of heart, that's not a physical condition, that's a spiritual condition. Uh, a physical heart, when it's all clogged up, can't do its job. A spiritual heart, when it's all clogged up, can't do its job. Our hearts need to be open to our Savior. Martin Luther King had a wonderful way of dealing with the parable of the Good Samaritan. He did it in just a couple of sentences. He said the priest and the Levite came by and they saw the wounded man on the ground bleeding, dying. And they asked themselves, what will happen to me if I stop and help him? What will happen to me? But the Samaritan came along and saw the man and asked a different question. What will happen to him if I don't stop? Huge, huge difference in perspective. Hard hearts and soft hearts. Hearts, spiritual hearts that work, spiritual, healthy hearts that help. The spiritual heart cannot function when it's clogged. Luke says it well, when your heart is open, the light floods in. When your heart is all blocked up, the light cannot penetrate. A hard heart should be your spiritual enemy. A soft heart, a sensitive heart, a thoughtful heart, a caring heart, should be on your to-do list. Amen.